Our first reading today comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Immediately, because this question came up in Bible study, immediately before this verse, Paul has, list out, list out, has made a list of vices, of things which are less appropriate. So that's why the, where the by contrast comes, because as I say, it came up at Bible study. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Our other reading comes from John chapter 15. Chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John's Gospel are the, his, Jesus' farewell discourse. The night before his arrest and execution. And he's some parting words of wisdom and comfort from John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if I do what, com I, what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. At the beginning, at the beginning of our faith story, we're in a garden. And the first commandment God gives to people is be fruitful and multiply, which we normally interpret in terms of multiply, emphasis on the multiply, and the fruitfulness is in the passing on of generations. But over and over again in the scripture story, we have these references to growing and abundance. And indeed, the end of our scripture story, we are once again in a garden. What does it mean to be fruitful? What does it mean to bear good fruit? In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew's Gospel, we have the line where Jesus is going on and saying, you'll know, you'll know how people are by what they show you, by their fruits. They shall be known. What kind of fruit do we produce? As I said, in the, earlier in chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul has listed out a list of vices. It's a normal Pauline list. Paul likes lists. 
Paul really likes lists at times. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions. But in contrast, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, kindness, peace, generosity, self-control, by their fruits they shall be known. What fruit do people see when they look at the church? Come back to that. As I said, John 15 is in the middle of Jesus' farewell discourse. He's preparing his friends for the fact that he's not going to be with them in the same way anymore. Hard words. And a a joining scholar that I often listen to suggests that this passage, despite its words that seem very harsh about judgment and branches being pruned away and thrown into the fire, is actually a pastoral message. It's meant to comfort. Because the emphasis isn't on the branches that that are withering away. The emphasis is on what do you do to not be a branch that withers away. Pruning, of course, is not just hacking away at a... I used to think pruning was hacking away at something to make it smaller. I then went to a uh, session instructing you how to actually prune your perennials and learned it's not. It's not just about keeping them small. Okay, if you have a wild lilac hedge, pruning is about hacking away at it to keep it smaller because wild lilacs will take over the entire yard if you let them. But pruning, especially for fruit, especially for things to produce, pruning is a way to shape and get more. Prune away that which isn't working. Prune away that which is diseased so that the plant can become more fruitful. We are called to be the branches that are fruitful. To prune away those things, which may be Paul's list of vices. Anger, dissensions, jealousy, quarreling, impurity, fractiousness. To prune those things away so that we can produce love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. But even more, In the words of Jesus, we are reminded that we don't... A branch by itself is useless. A branch just off by itself is the one that's going to wither away. But in terms of a grapevine, grapevines, you have a rootstock, which goes down into the ground. And then you have the branches, which are in a vineyard, often tied up so that they're supported. And they're what bear the fruit. The vine, without the branch... Not much use. The branch without the vine is going to wither away and die. Jesus reminds us that he is the vine. He is the core. He is the center of life. And we are the branches. Teresa of Avila, a medieval mystic, wrote words which are now translated in our hymn as, Christ has no body now but yours. We are the branches. Growing from the true vine. That's how we bear fruit. By remembering and maintaining our connection to the vine. That's why Jesus goes on to talk about abiding in him. Abiding is a word which is often used in John's gospel. And to abide, it means more than just to live. It means to dwell. It's something wholeness. It's deep. It holds us together. You live in a house, you dwell, you abide in a home. There's a depth there. Diana Butler Bass, in a piece that just hit my email last night at 9 o'clock, which is always a wonderful time to get new ideas for the sermon, but anyway, writes, the verb to abide is essentially the same as the noun abode, to await, to live with, stay with, remain. In its early English, it meant habitual residence. 
Dwell in me as I dwell in you. Make a home in me as I make a home in you. I will reside in you as you reside in me. The re relationship Jesus is calling us to is both ways, circular. It flows back and forth. But Bass writes, it's a powerful metaphor of God dwelling with us and us dwelling in God. So where do we get our fruitfulness? Where do we get our energy for life? Because we remain connected to the vine. Because we dwell in God. Because we abide in God's love. And God's love abides in us. And they build on each other. And the verb you, when you read you in that passage, it's not you singular as an individual. It's you as the community because the life of Jesus is always about the community. It's always plural. It's about how do we, are we fruitful together. Because again, the branch which is off by itself doesn't do well. The branch which is connected to the vine and is surrounded by other branches so that they cross-pollinate and cross-fertilize, that bears fruit. May God help us to abide, to, to open ourselves to the connection with the true vine. May God help us to prune away those parts of our lives which get in the way of being fruitful. May God help us to bear good, rich life-giving fruit, because I asked earlier, when the people look at the church, what fruit do they see, remembering in Matthew's gospel that where it says, by their fruit they shall be known. When people look at us as representatives of Christ on earth, what fruit do they see? I'm, going to I'm not going to answer that question, because I don't think I can answer that question. I think People see different things at different times. But I'm going to leave it there because I think it's something we always have to consider as we struggle, as we, as we seek to understand who God is calling us to be, how God is calling us to be in the world. When people look at us as individuals and as a community, what fruit do they see? Do they see fruit which is sour, turns your stomach? Or do they see fruit that's sweet and life-giving and bursting with joy as we live connected to the vine, as we live rooted in God's love, as we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us, may we bear good, sweet, joyful fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, and self-control. And may God grow in us. May God help us to grow and be fruitful. Amen.